I've had the chance to do a little bit of reading recently, and I have two great books, uh, which I will show you. One is Eye of the Vortex by Rodolfo Linus. I'm not talking about this one today, but if you're interested in consciousness and the self, uh, it's a really cool book. But the other one I just got, and it's really fascinating because it's called Accessing, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. So Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. Self-Help Exercises for Anxiety, Depression, Trauma, and Autism by Stanley Rosenberg. Uh, the forward is written by Stephen Porges. Uh, I don't know who Benjamin Shield is, but Stephen Porges wrote a book called uh, the uh, polyvagal theory. And we talk about the vagus nerve a lot in postural restoration and in particular in the cervical revolution course. So cervical revolution course is about the, the neck and about revolution, so rotation. The ability to rotate your neck without restriction. And I always tell people when people are asking about PRI and what it's all about, you know, that, that people kind of know now that it's about asymmetry in the left side and the right side, breathing, left hamstrings, right glutes, things like that. But I would say the, the whole point is to keep the neck relaxed. You don't want your neck doing anything that restricts its ability to move. When you cannot breathe with your left diaphragm, you're going to have to get more air into your right chest, which is gonna be compressed. The left diaphragm puts air into the right upper chest wall. When you are over on your right side because you are in a left AIC, right BC pattern, remember you're stuck on your right leg, your pelvis is oriented to the right, you're compressed on the right side, and yes, I know some people are gonna say, no, my right shoulder is higher than my left. I get that comment all the time. I understand that. That's just extra compensation. Underneath, you're still a right BC pattern, which means this rib cage on the right side, this chest wall all through the ribs, overactive right neck muscles, it's keeping you over on the right side. When you can't use your left diaphragm, you're gonna to start to use these neck muscles, the SCM and the scalenes and the upper trap to try to lift up your chest wall to get more air in there because it's compressed and the left diaphragm can't inflate this right side. So that's, that's the, you find that pretty much with everybody. Anyone who comes to see me and anyone who does online or Skype, whatever it's gonna be, they're always gonna have this issue, tight on the right side. They can't get air over here. So we have to keep the neck relaxed. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Because if you can't use the left diaphragm, you're gonna to start to use your neck to breathe. And then once this right SCM, this big, this thing is big, real big. Once that right SCM is overactive and it's trying to pull your chest up, it can start to pull too much, well, it will pull too much on the base of your skull, on the temporal bone. It will internally rotate it, compress it, it will, in different planes of motion, it may shift the jaw forward slightly. Now you have too much tooth contact on the right side. Your jaw might end up to the left. It becomes a, it can get very dicey. Let's put it that way. Now, in this book, he's taught, what I love about the book is he talks about shoulder, neck, and head pain. Cranial nerve 11, the trapezius, and the sternocleidomastoid, so the SCM. He talks about how these SCMs are like reins on a horse, right? They pull side to side to rotate your neck in gross movement. The ability to rotate back and forth side to side, bend side to side. Then the, the, more f the finer points of rotation are performed by the suboccipital muscles, which are back here. When you're locked into an extension pattern that we talk about in PRI all times, so that uh, PEC, uh, bilateral rib flare, forward head posture. He talks about it in here. The SCMs get at overactive and can pull your neck forward, and now you can't breathe properly. But the other thing is you can't rotate your head effectively. And when you can't, what's gonna happen? 
Oh, there's so many things I can talk about here, so I'm trying to limit myself. So in this little, here's the back of your neck and here's the base of your skull, the base of your skull. If that forward, if that net, so your eyes, or let's just say your eyes are horizontal and you need to maintain that horizontal line of sight. Once your neck comes forward, it's being pulled forward by the SCMs or they come forward because your spine is so arched that the only way you can keep a horizontal line of sight is bring your head forward. Either way, you're gonna end up in a forward head posture, which is really a forward neck posture, but either way, it messes your life up big time. And when that happens, look what has the, the base of the skull has to do. Boom, compression, boom. Base of the skull onto the top cervical vertebrae, which is the atlas. And look at all these important things, all this important cranial nerve circuitry comes out of this area. It'll come out of the borders of the occiput with the temporal bones. And the, remember, the temporal bone gets locked into a position here, and it closes the amount of space that's available for uh, the vagus nerve and, oh, some artery. I don't remember which one. Forward head, SCMs are overactive. You're using your neck to breathe. You can't use your diaphragms. Your back is extended. You can't rotate your body. You can't rotate through your thoracic spine. So it's going to come through the lumbar spine, and it's going to come through... Uh, SI joints, you, your legs are not going to be able to internally rotate, externally rotate appropriately. Your glutes are going to be dormant. You're going to be a, a, you're going to turn into an autonomically driven human being. That's what I was for uh, 38, at least 38, 39 years of my life. I'm now 43. Uh, you don't want to be that. But this is what he wrote. And this is what I love. He's talking about uh, animals on the Serengeti. For both the hunter and the hunted, survival depends in part on turning their heads effortlessly. And the muscles primarily responsible for this are the trapezius and the SCMs, both innervated by cranial nerve 11, which is called the accessory nerve. Because turning the head is a matter of life and death, not just for these animals, but for us also. It is not surprising that the structure of Cranial nerve 11 is highly developed and complex for precise innervation of the individual fibers of these muscles. So that was really cool that he is recognizing the role of the SCM and what it can do. Oh, and he, and he does talk about the internal rotation, the temporal bone, which causes other issues. He talks about asymmetries in SCM tension. He also talks about asymmetries in the trapezius. And when you have asymmetries in the trapezius, you know, all three, upper, middle, lower, uh, because of the fact that these, the trapezius rotates the spine, it can cause major issues and compression. And actually he talks about, oh, where is it? Oh, crap. Uh, he talks about how it will compress your rib cage, which is what we find over on the right side all the time. In one of his classes, he teaches, at the start of the experiment, a student observed that his thumbs were horizontal, which means they were, they were checking the position of his atlas, okay? And because the thumbs were, uh, horizontal, were in line with each other, he knew that his atlas was aligned properly. Then I, sem then I simply thought about something that was disturbing to me. Immediately the transverse process, transverse process are these, this is the spinous process, which is basically like the back of the spine, and the transverse are on the sides. The, uh, immediately, the transverse process of C1 moved. One side went up, another went down. So that would be frontal plane. There's always going to be frontal plane and rotation, though. The position of C1 felt like it had rotated approximately 45 degrees away from the horizontal, with one side up and the other side down. Although this observation uh, the only explanation I have is that the rotation must be a complex combination of the repositioning of C1, C2, and C3 taken together. And all he had to do was have an unpleasant thought. I found the experience highly unpleasant since I had to undergo a change of state away from social engagement. And social engagement is what humans do on a normal basis. Uh, you know, it's normal interaction probably not what most people are experiencing right now since we're all kind of sitting at home with the coronavirus. So I'm, I'm sure probably a lot of you are sitting at home these days, probably all over the world, with C1, C2, and C3 rotated to the right 
because we're constantly under stress and anxiety, uh, most of us, depending on how you deal with it, uh, just listening to, the, listening to the news. He doesn't say, and then he said uh, he was able to, with a little technique that I'm not even sure what it is, to get these, the C1, C2, C3 to rotate back to the center again, so it went back to a neutral state. The important thing to realize, though, he didn't say whether it was to the right, the rotation was to the right or to the left. I suspect it would be to the right. Why would it be to the right? Well, if you're in a, remember, he's talking about fight or flight. He put himself willingly, with a thought, into fight or flight. If you watch my videos, I'm talking about this all the time. Necks are autonomic. Fight or flight. He, he had a fight or flight thought, and it went rotated to the right. That is the pattern. When you are stuck in a fight or flight position, you're going to be to the right. That's what our testing always shows. And the important thing is that he is not seeing it as a pattern. He's just observing it. Postural restoration sees it as a pattern, a pattern. I guarantee that his body would also reflect right stance, phase of walking. And I can't remember, there was something, he has something else about that, he said something else about that was pretty interesting. But uh, it does not require a trauma to affect C1 and C2. The memory of a past event can do the same thing. When C1 and C2 come back into place, it relieves tension on the vertebral arteries, providing better blood flow to the brain and brainstem and allows us to return to social engagement. So he is saying that this rotation to the right is adaptive. It's, it's part of how humans respond to threatening situations. And it's actually a good thing under the correct circumstances. However, if you're living in this position, which if you have a right TMCC pattern, you likely are, over time, things start to go wrong. Your neck, instead of just temporarily being tight because you're in a fight or flight response dealing with you know, some, sort of, uh, some sort of danger, when you're living in it, now you can't move properly. You can't rotate, and guess what? You can't get to the left. So he's... He'll probably, he said he was using a certain technique to, to get these C1, C2, C3 back to the center again. But I can tell you that if you get someone to pronate on their right foot and sense the ground underneath their left heel, this thing will rotate and you've turned off a pattern and now you can actually get to the left. If you only try to do his little technique in this book to realign C1, C2, C3 back to the center, that might be great temporarily, but you're still not using the left side. So you can turn a neck off by sensing the ground underneath the arch of the right foot, the ground underneath the heel of the left foot, and sensing your body weight through that left side will also derotate C1, C2, C3 back to the left and actually bring you all the way back to the left so you can get that left ZOA, left AFIR, left stance position, which I'm pretty sure he probably doesn't have on a continual basis. But that's it. I have nothing else to say. This has gone long enough. That was all over the place, but it's a cool book. I highly recommend reading it if you're interested in this thing. And if you're trying to learn PRI, uh, it's a great book because, you know, he's really talking about a lot of stuff that comes up in the lives of people that are, you are working with.